yes namaste this is uh, sneha nagarkar here this exp- uh, this lecture series uh, consisting of experts from different fields has been organized by the vivekananda kendra kanyakumari and the vivekananda prabodhini mumbai to commemorate the 75th anniversary of indian independence i am really thankful to the organizers for having given me this opportunity to share my thoughts on the mathura school of art mathura as we know is the birthplace of lord shri krishna and it has got a very long and checkered history since the 3rd century bce mathura developed as a center of hinduism and jainism and later in the 1st century ce it became a center of buddhism along with folk or uh, we can say regional uh, religions and uh, from the shunga period onwards that is from the 2nd century bce onwards mathura also developed as a center for art and the mathura school of art as it is known has its own unique place in the history of indian art so i will start my uh, lecture now as we all know mathura on the yamuna is famous as the birthplace of lord shri krishna i have already mentioned that and during the time of the buddha it is believed that mathura was a small rural settlement it rose to prominence during the kushana rule and it became the eastern capital of the kushanas it was a center of the bhagavata buddhist and jaina cults and it also was a very important trade center by mathura art it is meant art produced in the ancient shura sena region or the vraja or braja region mentioned in texts like the mahabharata hari vamsha <coughs> as well as jain and buddhist literature and the mahabhashya of patanjali we have the beginnings of mathura art in the shunga period it reached its high point during uh, the reigns of kanishka huvishka and vasudeva this is according to acharya vasudev sharan agarwal and these three were very well known kushana emperors and uh, scholars like vasudev sharan agarwal and np joshi have worked extensively on the mathura school of art study uh, when we study the earliest sculptures from mathura we uh, understand that there was prevalence of a number of sects religious sects and mathura was a major center for artistic production mathura started gaining cultural and economic importance from the 3rd century bce archaeological excavations conducted at the site of song revealed that in the pre mauryan period mathura was more of a rural settlement no sculptures or ar- architectural pieces in stone have been found before the mid 2nd century bce in mathura urban it is generally assumed that urbanization of mathura started in the early fir- uh, mauryan period and it reached its height by the 1st century ce megasthenes the greek ambassador who visited uh, the court of chandragupta maurya in the 4th century bce he states that uh, there were two cities of methora and klaisbora and they were on the uh, river yamuna and methora has been mentioned as a city of the shura senoi people on the banks of the yamuna mathura has been mentioned in the valmiki ramayan the hari vamsha and later puranas including the mahatmyas of mathura mathura has been mentioned almost 8 times in patanjali's mahabhashya buddhist texts dated to around the 2nd century ce like the ashoka avadana and divya avadana refer to mathura as a fairly large city yuan zhang mentions that ashoka constructed three stupas at mathura 
but this is not corroborated by any other evidence. And Hindu and Jaina traditions were predominant in Mathura in the two centuries before the common era. So coming now to the art uh, aspect, uh, any school of sculpture has basically two types of sculpture. One are sculptures in the round, that is, they are completely three-dimensional, whereas the other type is sculptures in relief. As you can see in this picture, this is uh, these are images of Kartikeya and Agni, and they are both in bold relief, that is, they are not completely separated from the parent rock. So they are in relief, but here they are in bold relief. Okay. Now, uh, features of Mathura art, as stated by uh, Vasudev Sharan Agarwal, are that uh, the geographical position of Mathura on the highway leading from Madhya Desha towards Madhra Gandhara contributed greatly towards its cosmopolitan culture. Mathura was the meeting point of early Indian art from Bharut and Sanchi, together with strong influences of the Gandhara art from Northwest. Then we also find the free use of Hellenistic motifs and themes like the honeysuckle, acanthus, bachchan alien scenes, garland bearing erodes, tritons, Heracles and the Namian line, etc. Also, we have a fusion of old folk cults of Yakshas, Nagas with the new forms of worship introduced by the Buddhists, Jainas and Hindus. According to Ananda Kumaraswamy, the Mathura art of the Kushana period represents direct development of the older art at Bharut and the still older art at Besnagar. However, impact of the Mathura school of the Shunga period on its Kushana successor cannot be denied. Mathura is situated at the junction of North India, Western India and Madhya Desha. Also, we have an amalgam of three cultures, Indian, Indo-Scythian and Hellenistic. We have three major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism and mainly three stages, Maurya Shunga, Shaka Kushana and Gupta. So we come to um, uh, the three stages. We'll just have a brief look at them and then we'll get into their details. So uh, in the Maurya Shunga period, we have the inheritance of the most ancient art forms and motifs of folk religions. So we have images of Sri or Lakshmi, Purana Ghatta, Chakra worship, Chaitya worship, Yakshas and Nagas. Then coming to the Shaka Kushana phase, according to Vasudev Sharan Agarwal, it was the prolific creativity and gushing devotion to new art forms which characterized the Shaka Kushana phase. We have the origin of uh, the Buddha image and we have sects in Buddhism like the Sarvastivadins and the Mahasangikas whose focus was on the image of the Buddha. Then coming to Gupta, we have continuity of the previous traditions but with significant additions. In tune with the Gupta art produced at other centers like Sarna, the school of at Mathura, actually the school at Sarna is considered to be an offshoot of the Mathura school of art. But even uh, in the Gupta period, along with Sarnath, Mathura continued to be an important uh, center for art. And Sarnath, as I've already said, was a, a, in continuity of the Mathura school of art. So we have major sites in Mathura and uh, its surroundings which have yielded uh, many sculptures. So we have Katra or Katra Keshav Deva, Kankali Tila, Chaubara, Jamalpur, Song, Govindanagar, Bhuteshwar, Parikhera, Chaurasi, Saptarshi, Mart and Vrindavan. A survey of explorations and excavations in and around Mathura reveals that during the early centuries of the common era, Mathura was a great center of art with deep-rooted individual site, uh, style. So this is a map of uh, the Mathura district. And here I have circled some of the uh, important sites. So we have 
Song here, then Janasuti towards the north of Song, then in the south we have Parkham. So these are then here we have Mart, here we have Brindavan. So these are some of the important uh, centers of Mathura, of the Mathura School of Art. And these are certain centers within uh, the city of Mathura, not Mathura district, but within the city of Mathura, like you have Katra here. Then uh, we have the Ambarish Mound here. We have the Saptarshi Mound uh, here. Govind Nagar here. So we have different Chaubara Mound here, Kankali Mound here. So we have different sites within the city of Mathura as well, which have yielded evidence for the Mathura School of Art. Now the material uh, used for uh, the Mathura School of Art was mainly the red mottled sandstone we find the use of red mottled sandstone mainly in the shaka kushana phase of the mathura school of art and this was this stone was quarried from agra sikri rupabas karoli and uh, sculptures produced at mathura have been supplied to different places like ahichhatra sanchi Sarnath, Kaushambi, Chandraketu Gad, Mahasthan. Now, Chandraketu Gad and Mahasthan are in Bengal. Then we have Sangor in Punjab. And of course, the well known Takshashila. So, we understand that the catchment area of the sculptures of the Mathura School of Art was indeed very large. So, uh, the history of Mathura uh, goes back to the prehistoric period, and a few Paleolithic tools were discovered near the Govardhan Ridge in 1975. These, this is a photograph of some of those tools which have been preserved in the Mathura Museum. Then copper cells dating back to the second millennium BCE have been discovered at Sadabad uh, in the Mathura district. They are associated with the ochre colored pottery. Excavations were conducted at the site of Song by uh, the German uh, archaeologist H. Hartel from 96, uh, 1966 to 74. And uh, pottery like painted grey ware, black and red ware, northern black polished ware, Gupta period pottery, terracottas were unearthed at Song. Even a Naga shrine, a shrine dedicated to a Naga deity was also unearthed at Song. This is a landmark excavation in the history of Math you know, in the history of research as far as Mathura is concerned. And these are some of the artifacts which were excavated at Sonk. This particular artifact that you see is a votive tank. So basically it used to be filled with water and there are lamps on its rim as you can see. This is a model of a house from Sonk. So we get an idea what kind of houses were there in the early historic period in Mathura. Now, uh, earliest figures at Mathura are datable uh, to the pre-Mauryan period. These figures are mainly in terracotta, not in stone. So uh, they are made completely by hand and not by a mold. The eyes have been incised and the nose has been made through pinching. Ornaments and hands and legs have been attached separately. Most of the figures are nude. Most of the figurines are those of females. And according to R.C. Sharma, they may represent the cult of the mother goddess. The figures are grey in colour with a black slip. So this is a feature, this is a sculpture of a foreigner. He looks a, like a foreigner who is having his meal. So this is in terracotta. And this is a, an image of a mother goddess, supposedly of a mother goddess um, that was found at Mathura. And of course, she's not completely nude, but she is very uh, elaborately dressed, especially look at her headgear. It has all kinds of ornaments. She's wearing very huge earrings and the two earrings are not similar. And necklaces and uh, she's wearing thick anklets. So this, this these two uh, figures represent the Ma Mauryan or the Shunga period in the art of Mathura, Mauryan and the Shunga period. Then this is another figure of a lady belonging to the Shunga period. Look at her beautiful head, head hairstyle and uh, her beautiful waistband, her necklaces, very beautiful, very intricately carved. 
and this is another figure here especially her hairstyle is very beautiful she is wearing a sash on her waist and this is a couple this is also in terracotta now coming to the shunga phase in the art of mathura the sculptures are not in bold relief male and female figures are both depicted with many ornaments and the men have elaborate headdresses and the women have elaborate hairstyles the turbans of the male figures have a conspicuous crest at the top wreaths flower garlands beads pieces of cloth have been used as hair accessories in the female figures and there is a lot of attention given to detail the clothing that is the drapery is heavy compared to the later periods the figures uh, lack any kind of facial expressions and appear static and one more thing that i noticed is that they appear to be aloof from their surroundings or original contexts and as far as eyes are concerned the eyeballs have not been carved then most of the figures are those of yakshas like mani bhadra agni pani yaksha mudgara pani yaksha and royal figures most of these figures are life size there are hardly few figures of hindu or jain divinities there is an image of balaram from the village of janasuti near mathura dating to the shunga period this is considered to be the oldest image of balaram so we now come to the parkham yaksha parkham is a place near mathura and the name of this yaksha is mani bhadra and we know this from an inscription on this image <clears throat> mani bhadra is the name uh, of a yaksha associated with kaushambi and padmavati padmavati is modern pavaya near gwalior and <clears throat> according to vs agrawal h luders gv mitter walner he this figure represents a yaksha and not kubera kubera is the king of the yaksha he is called yakshashwara or yakshendra and it is dated to the 2nd century bce by vogel and luders now if you see this image is life size it's a life size statue unfortunately the arms are broken so we don't know uh, what uh, this figure held uh, must have held in its hands and it is wearing in very thick uh, necklaces a chest band a diaphanous dhoti as you can see and a waist band and if you see the image is very corpulent it is very well built and corpulent and it has a slight pot belly its stomach is protruding so uh, these are some of the features that we see in this particular figure from parkham and this image was caused to be made by eight brothers who were members of the mani bhadra or the mani bhadra clan and it was made by a sculptor called gomita who was a disciple of kunika in the sculpture as you can see there are remnants of a money bag and evidence of we have an evidence of an inscription it does not indicate any connection with a trade uh, guild as such according to dc sarkar yaksha mahani bhadra was the protector of travelers and caravans and perhaps this image was installed on a trade route now after this uh, image was this image was discovered by uh, alexander cunningham and after it was brought by him uh, brought by him from the place where it was discovered the villagers placed another modern image of a yaksha there so what i am trying to say is that yaksha worship has continued till the modern period it is not a part of mainstream hinduism but at a local level at a regional level we still find people worshiping yaksha so this you know this tradition which goes back thousands of years has continued right up to the 21st century now uh, if you see the buddhist text mahamayuri the guardian yaksha of mathura is a person called gardhavaka and he was a malevolent yaksha of mathura and uh, some scholars have tried to identify the parkham yaksha with gardhavaka but 
the general scholarship says that no, this is not Vardhavaka, it is Manibhadra Yaksha. And Manibhadra is supposed to be a deputy of uh, Kubera. So we'll just see a few sculptures in brief. So this is identified with a, uh, this figure is identified with that of a Nati or a lady dancer, if I may say. Nati actually means uh, an actress, but here she is mainly in the role of a dancer. And if you see, she's got an elaborate coiffure. It's a beautiful hairstyle that she is, uh, I mean, which she has. And she's wearing very heavy ornaments. She's She's beautifully decorated with ornaments. She wears a transparent sari. It's not very clear, but she wears some kind of a transparent clothing. She wears a very heavy wa uh, waist girdle, which is also seen in the Kushana period yakshis. Then we come to the Mora well torso. This is uh, one of the five images of the Vrishni heroes, which was found at Mora. Mora is a village near Mathura. And uh, this belongs to the period of Mahakshatrapa Shodasa. So the uh, so it, it represents a period between the late part of the first century BCE and the early part of the first century CE. And if you see the sculpting of uh, this particular image, it befits a hero. And uh, the images of the five Vrishni heroes were installed in a stone temple by a lady called Tosha. This we know from an epigraph. And who are the five Vrishni heroes? The five Vrishni hero heroes are Vasudeva Krishna, his brother Sankarshana Balaram, Krishna's two sons Pradyumna and Samba, and Krishna's grandson Aniruddha. So we have the worship of these Pancha Vrishni Viras in Mathura in the late Shunga and early Shaka period. Then this is another uh, image of a Yaksha with a club in his hand and a child in his left hand. If you see the child is in the Namaskara Mudra and this this uh, sculpture is supposed to be showing the Mahasutta Soma Jataka. If you see even this Yaksha is wearing a very beautiful turban, a very elaborate turban and uh, he's wearing heavy earrings, heavy necklaces. The sculpture is in bold relief. It's a broken sculpture, but whatever remains that we can see, it's a bold sculpture. Of course, the significance of the child is not yet very clear why he is holding the child in his hand. Then we come to this another image, which is supposed to represent uh, a prince, a royal figure. Very, uh, this is a very beautiful figure. As you can see, it is a well-built figure, but it is not corpulent like the Yaksha's body. It is wearing uh, very uh, beautiful uh, ornaments, very heavy kundalas as you can see, very heavy and unfortunately his hands are broken so we are unable to understand what he might have held in his hands and he's wearing a diaphanous dhoti with a waist band. So the, he definitely represents some royal figure, perhaps a royal prince or some royal figure as such. Then this is also a royal figure, as you can see, uh, beautiful turban. Now you, must, you must have observed it even though these are images of the same period found in the same area. They, they have There is a lot of variety in them. And especially when it comes to the variety in head headdresses. So here also he's wearing a beautiful headdress. Here also like the previous figure, he's wearing very heavy kundalas. Beautiful necklaces. Now these necklaces are a, are slightly different than uh, what we saw in the previous images. They are more delicate, and he's wearing a dhoti, and um, he's also wearing some kind of an upper garment, as you can see this on his uh, left hand, and he's holding something in his left hand. It's not clear what he's holding, but he's holding some his left hand, and this figure also represents a royal figure. Then uh, we have a male torch bearer or chauri bearer. This is not clear whether he's holding a torch or a, a chauri. And this figure was discovered from the Jamalpur mounds. It, it is carved in low relief. 
and it must have been part of a larger panel or it might have been flanking a gateway to a shrine or stupa now if you see the facial expression conveys nothing the face is expressionless but the cheeks are slightly chubby and the he is wearing an upper garment which is almost transparent and he wears a very beautiful turban also noteworthy is two of his necklaces now even if you see there is a lot of attention given to even the necklaces the design on the necklaces and he is also wearing beautiful keuras or arm bands his earrings are not large like the previous figures this is uh, not a very good photograph but this is an image of balarama from janasuti that i mentioned this is now in the lucknow museum and he is holding a plow and a pestle and as you can see there is a snake canopy over his head and we all know that uh, balarama is supposed to be an incarnation of uh, Shesha, Adi Shesha. Now, if you see the Buddha figure during the Shunga period or the Maurya Shunga period is completely absent, but he is represented as a stupa, Tri Ratna, Vajrasana, Ushanisha, Bodhi Vruksha, and Dharma Chakra. All these symbols are associated with the life of the Buddha as a whole or some episode in his life. The halo or Prabha Mandala was also used as a symbol to represent the Buddha. In all probability, the Mathura school was a pioneer in this. So here you can see a Chaitya Vruksha. It may represent the Bodhi tree or it may not represent the Bodhi tree. It is not clear. But as you can see, this is a Chaitya Vruksha. It is enclosed in a railing or a Vedika. There are two Chhatras here meant for uh, perhaps you know, as a symbol of the divinity of this ruksha and it is it has been uh, kept in some kind of a pavilion which has shikharas okay, so we get an idea about the architecture of that period also and overall if you see this uh, particular tree is in low relief now if you see figures of the maurya shunga period or especially the shunga period they lack a three-dimensional effect Railing pillars belonging to the Shunga period have also been found and religious and non-religious themes were both depicted on these railings and Mathura art of this period shows an impact of the art of Bharat and Vidisha, especially Bharat because if you see even the figures at Bharat are that way expressionless and they are in low relief. So uh, especially when it comes to the facial expression, the early Mathura sculptures show an impact of the school at Bharat. Buddha has not been represented in a human form, but he is shown through symbols. Many small sculptures like those of a Kamadeva, a lady playing the lute, a drummer, etc. have also been found. Now we come to the Kushana art. Now, the Kushana period represents a new paradigm in the history of India. We have new rulers. These the Kushanas came from a part of China and through uh, Central Asia and uh, they came to India and uh, the, their capital was at Purushapura or uh, modern Peshawar in Pakistan and Mathura was the eastern capital of the Kushanas. So we have new rulers, new environments and new traditions and this gave rise to the Mathura school of sculpture of the Kushana period. Now generally when we say Mathura school of art, though it actually encompasses the art from the Shunga period to the post uh, Gupta period, generally when the term Mathura art is used, it is applied specifically to the art of the Kushana period, the Mathura art of the Kushana period, because it is very distinct. And the sculptures are also found in large numbers which belong to this phase. And overall also, the history of Mathura underwent a lot of changes during 
the Kushana period and the Kushana emperors contributed immensely for the emergence and development, growth of this form of art. And the reigns of Kanishka, Huvishka and Vasudeva or Vasudeva are considered to be the golden era of Kushana art. And we have the complete evolution of all its characteristics. And we have Vaishnava, Jaina and Buddhist images as well as Shivalingas and secular motives which have been represented in the art of Mathura belonging to the Kushana period. So we'll just see some of the stylistic features. So first is depiction of human beings. The Mathura sculptors depicted human figures from different angles rather than the traditional in-face depiction. So if you see in the previous sculptures, there was a lot of emphasis on the frontality of the sculptures. But now we find that we have the representation of sculptures from different angles. And there is more grace in the sculpture. Like this particular sculpture of a Yakshi that you see, she is supposed to be carrying a cage with a parrot in it. And if you see, she is her she is not standing straight, but her body is slightly bent. And uh, she's actually, if you see, she's standing in the Tribhanga pose. And this is adding to her beauty, adding to her sensuousness. Also, the artists of this period were particularly adept at depicting feminine beauty, which uh, indicated a higher plane of sensibility. Then the female figures, the Yakshis, have been represented as being engaged in various activities like playing with parrots, that is Shuka Krida, drinking wine, Madhupana, and other activities. And the theme of Shungara is highlighted. We also have the depiction of male figures like Yakshas, Kubera, Surya, Maitre and Bodhisattvas, which is equally effective. Kubera is shown with a pot belly. Surya is in the Udicha Vesh or the Northerner's dress. Mathura, uh, sorry, Maitreya and other Bodhisattvas are in royal finery. We also find Kushana royal officers in courtly dresses. And we also have the portrait statues of the Kushana emperors. And this these statues represent their royal power. So basically, even in terms of iconography, the iconography of the figures was also very well developed by the Kushana period. And we find a far greater variety in the Kushana period art in comparison to the Shunga period art of Mathura. Then the second feature is development of style. The Kushana carvings uh, generally are bold in style and not flat. Height of the figures increases and the proportion of subsidiary figures is adjusted. <clears throat> Bulky figures of the earlier periods make way to proportionate and slim figures, suggesting a more refined artistic variety. <clears throat> The upper garment is thrown across the shoulders and drawn across the legs and the hips. Then in the, uh, <clears throat> in the early Kushana art, male figures <clears throat> had their left shoulder covered with an upper garment which appears to be clinging to it. The lower part of the body has been worked less upon. Thighs and legs are stiff. Uh, we will see in the figures. Early Kushana sculptures are more stiff in comparison to the later ones, which are generally seen standing more gracefully with one leg slightly bent. This is mainly from the 2nd century CE. Another important feature of the Kushana Mathura art is the carving of figures in the round. So we have three dimensional figures. Many sculptures have been carved on both the sides and both the sides have been given equal attention. So we have uh, you know, two styles for carving the rear side. One was the rear view of the hairstyle, muscles, attire and ornaments of the figures on the front side. And the second uh, style was a stem, leaves or a tree like Ashoka or Kadamba 
with birds and squirrels seated on them. Then the third uh, feature is new method of narrating stories. Sequence of the narrative uh, narratives in the panels at Mathura was intercepted by either decorative bands, pilasters, etc. Here you can see something like a Vedika um, railing here, as you can see, and here you can see uh, Chaitya windows. Sometimes the narrative panels were depicted one above the other in a vertical arrangement. So here you can see this is supposed to be a, <clears throat> a depiction of an episode from the Saundarananda, uh, which is a work by uh, the Buddhist monk Ashwagosha. Then uh, sometimes the whole door jam would be decorated with panels depicting the complete story. So this is a perhaps a part of, of a door jam. And if you see the theme of Shungara, you can see the theme of Shungara. This is the hero is dressing the hair of the heroine. Then there is an effective combination of old and new motifs. So we have incorporation of conventional motifs and introduction of new motifs. We have nature figures like trees, creepers, animals, birds, which have been extensively used. We also have a number of hybrid animals like Ihamraga, which has a crocodile with a with parrot-like beak, a lion with dog-like paws, which have been depicted in the Mathura School of Art. These motifs may be classified into two categories. So first we have the Indian motifs. Motifs used in Indian art before its interaction with Indo-Greek art. So we have uh, birds, animals, chaitya windows, bead and reel border, eight auspicious symbols, lines of bells, etc. So the eight auspicious symbols, actually here I have uh, given a list of nine, are full vase or purana kumbha, sacred seat or vajrasana, swastika, then we have two fishes which represents the meena maituna, then two bowls placed one over the other, Shrava Samputa, then we have the jewel pot, Ratna Patra, then Tri Ratna, Nandya Varta, and Shri Vatsa. And many of these uh, you know, auspicious symbols were seen across the sects. This was not just that only they were used in Jainism or they were only used in Hinduism. No, they were used across the sects. Like for example, the Shri Vatsa symbol is used in Hinduism also on images of Vishnu. And it was also used on uh, the images of the Jaina Tirthankaras. <clears throat> so here is uh, the Tri Ratna, which is a Mangala Chinha or an auspicious symbol. And here, if you can see this, this comes from a Jaina context. This was found from the Kankali Tila at Mathura, and this comes from a Jaina context and the Tri Ratna symbol was also an important symbol in Jainism. Generally, we associate the Tri Ratna symbol with Buddhism, but it is also found in Jainism. And here we have uh, a sh the Shri Vatsa symbol. This is from an inscription. This is this inscription belongs to the reign of uh, the Shaka ruler Shodasa. So this is the three Ratna symbol. Then uh, we have new motifs bearing foreign influences like uh, like uh, these were introduced in the Mathura school of art after its interaction with the contemporary Gandhara art. Gandhara art was also uh, patronized by the Kushana rulers, especially uh, Kanishka and uh, Gandhara art also has uh, uh, depictions about Buddha, Bodhisattvas, and then even a few narratives from uh, Buddhist lore, as well as uh, you know episodes from the life of the Buddha. And uh, we also find an influence of Iranian and Greek styles. So we have wine creepers, Corinthian capital, acanthus leaves, and we have the Maladhari Yaksha, which is similar to the garland bearing erodes. Then the fifth feature is uh, influence of the Gandhara art. Very few sculptures from Mathura actually show an influence of the Gandhara school. 
The Gandhara school, as we know, it was a mixture of Hellenistic and Indian features. In fact, it is said that the Gandhara school was Greek in form, but Indian in its soul. So the themes represented are Indian, but the style of execution is Greek. It is influenced by the Greek school of art. Also, uh, the Greek influence is seen more at a later stage around the reign of the Kushana emperor Vasudeva. This is a, a sculpture of a lady called Kambojika, who is supposed to be a Shaka queen. And uh, <clears throat> if you see, she is completely dressed. Because if we see the female figurines from uh, Mathura, they are actually uh, almost nude and they are only wearing ornaments. As well. But she is wearing something like a sari. And even her jewelry, her face is very different. It shows an influence of the Gandhara school of art. And as we know, Gandhara and Mathura schools of art were both patronized by the Kushanas. <clears throat> Artists of the Mathura school incorporated foreign art features to suit the Indian conditions and thought processes. Gandhara features like heavy folds of the drapery, wavy curls, and sharp facial features were integrated into the Mathura school of art. You also have the Bachchan alien scenes. The Bachchan alien scenes are mainly scenes where Kubera is shown drinking, drinking wine, drinking some kind of an intoxicating drink. And here, as you know, we have the sculpture, as I said, of Kambojika, who was the queen of Mahakshatrapa Rajula, or Rajuvula, as he's also called, who ruled over Mathura. And you see the folds of the drapery. They are quite heavy and beautifully carved, very realistically carved. And she's wearing beautiful ornaments. Then uh, <clears throat> following images from Mathura show the influence of Gandhara art. Certain special features like semicircular folds of the drapery, as we just saw, head covered with wavy curls, heavy eyelids of the Buddha and Bozi Sattva figures, then some of the scenes of the Buddha's life, decorative motives, sculptures depicting foreign themes like Heracles, the Nemean lion, etc. And the sixth feature is introduction of portrait sculptures. In the Kushana period, <clears throat> we have the first instance of life-size statues in the history of Indian art. And we find life-size portrait sculptures of Kushana kings like Bhima Karfisis, Kanishka, and the Kshatrapa Chashtana with their names inscribed below. Probably the statue of Huvishka is worshipped as Lord Shiva in the Gokarneshwar Mahadev temple in Mathura. There is actually a, a difference of opinion. Some scholars say that is Huvishka, whereas some, some scholars say that no, it is actually an image of Surya. Before uh, <clears throat> these life-size uh, sculptures, we also have representations of kings like Ashoka at sites like Kanagana Halli and Sanchi. But they are not life-size images and they are in low relief. These uh, statues of the Kushana emperors were originally kept in, uh, in royal sanctuaries which were known as Devakulas. So there is one such Devakula uh, at Mart. Mart uh, is a village near Vrindavan. It is across the Yamuna. And there, there was a Devakula. And even they, there were other Devakulas also of the Kushanas in the Northwestern uh, Frontier Province, as it was known initially, so in modern Pakistan and Afghanistan. And there was one such Devakula, which was found at a uh, mart near Vrindavan, and these statues were kept there. And uh, we have another Devakula, or it was as it was called Bago Lango, in the Bactrian language of the Kushana, that Surk Kotal in Afghanistan. And here the figure of Kanishka is similar to his figure on the coins. Now here you can see this is a large life-size sculpture of Kanishka. And if you see Kanishka, uh, unfortunately his hands are broken and uh, his head is broken. 
but uh, we can re uh, you know, we can reconstruct this image based on his uh, images found on his coins and it's a very bold image okay? it conveys a sense of authority and power he is holding two swords he is wearing a, a, a beautiful uh, kind of an upper garment as you can see something like an angarkha and he is wearing heavy boots and trousers and you know the fact that he is shown with these two swords it shows that how powerful he was as a king so when you actually see this image you are absolutely awestruck we really don't know the reason why the head of this image is not there but uh, some scholars say that in later times uh, the devakula at mart was uh, was you know destroyed and perhaps during that his head was lost this is a statue of vima kadfisis kanishka's father also from mart even his head is missing but as you can see he is sitting on a uh, lion throne or a sihansana and uh, his hands are that way intact but his head is not there and uh, this image also is life size and it conveys a sense of power and authority then this is uh, <clears throat> supposed to be an image of a, uh, you can say a military commander or some kind of a nobleman under the uh, kushanas then we come to the categories of sculptures <clears throat> carving of images of tirthankaras and the buddha as well as the earliest images of brahmanical deities like vishnu balarama shiva durga kubera etc was the important contribution of the mathura art and this is the opinion of uh, np joshi who was also the uh, director of the mathura museum uh, and uh, he has written a book on mathura <clears throat> sculptures <clears throat> so we'll first see the jaina uh, sculptures so here is a is a photograph of the excavation that the kankali tila the kankali kankali tila was excavated in the late uh, part of the 19th century by uh, an archaeologist called furer and here you can see images being ex excavated so we first come to the jain tirthankara images jainism was initially opposed to image worship but the changing religio cultural conditions which gave rise to the concept of bhakti had an impact on jainism as well initially if you see worship was offered to symbols like the sacred pillar sacred tree eight auspicious symbols stupa dharma chakra shri vatsa which were accepted and worshiped by the jainas the jainas also worshiped votive tablets called ayaga patta which had uh, more than one symbol and the figure of a jina also we have the images of tirthankaras and jinas which were found at kankali tila Kankali Tila was the most prominent Jaina site in Mathura. It had stupas and monasteries. It was also the site of the Jaina Deva Nirmita Stupa, which has been described in texts like the Vividha Tirtha Kalpa. And uh, according to N. P. Joshi, it is difficult to say whether the Tirthankara figures precede the Buddha images. We can one thing we can clearly say that they are more or less co-even. then we come to the features of the tirthankara figure this is the figure of a tirthankara from kankali tila we cannot definitely say who this tirthankara is uh, but we, we, as you can see there is this shri vatsa mark on his chest and he is seated in the dhyana mudra uh, one speciality of uh, tirthankara images is that they are either found in uh, the dhyana mudra or the kayota sarga mudra that is standing straight you will never find uh, jaina tirthankara images in the varada or the abhaya mudra the reason for this is that 
the tirthankaras are not considered as god in fact there is no concept of god as such in jainism and you can emulate them you can't ask them for giving you say a job or you know giving you money and things like that no you you can only emulate their good qualities you you can be inspired by them that's it they are not really god as such they are great men they are definitely great men but you can't really ask them for any boons so uh, the heads of the tirthankaras are either completely shaven or they have small curls eyeballs are generally absent sculptors of a later age have etched eyeballs in the kushana images their ear lobes do not necessarily touch the shoulders the faces are almost expressionless in some cases there may be a gentle smile but this feature is rarely found when seated in padmasana their souls have symbols like tri ratna and dharma chakra here we can't see but perhaps this image has such symbols then on the palms we have uh, the design of a wheel tips of fingers of palms and feet have have the shri vatsa symbol and this may uh, have been emu- this may have been emulated by the buddhists then these sacred symbols are indications of an extraordinary man that is purushottama the lanchanas associated with figures of the tirthankaras are absent in the figures of the kushana period but there are some marks of distinction like uh, you know in the figures of adinath or rishabnath or rishabdeva who was the first tirthankara we have locks of hair touching the shoulders and in the case of parshvanatha parshvanatha was the 23rd tirthankara we have a, a, a snake canopy over his head then we have some figures like uh, neminatha who has been called arishta nemi in the jain hari vamsha purana who can be identified as they are flanked by the figures of krishna and balaram so here you, this is a an image of uh, nemina then these two figures that you see below are krishna and balaram images and uh, then uh, some of the images have inscriptions on their pedestals most of the figures are without any garments sometimes they may be seated on a simhasana or a lion throne indicating their status as chakravartins in some figures there is a prabha mandala with a crescent hastinaka border here as you can see here here you can see a crescent like border then uh, we also have the sarvato bhadra pratimas of jain tirthankaras from the kushana period so what are these sarvato bhadra pratimas basically we have one block of stone and on all four sides of the stone we have images of the jain tirthankaras generally adinath and parshvanath will always be shown and the other two tirthankaras will change then uh, we have other jain figures like nayagamesha nayagamesha is a uh, jain deity with a goat head then we have revati or sashti who is supposed to be a goddess with a goat head saraswati krishna and balaram of course krishna and balaram play a very subsidiary role in uh, jainism this is a sarvato bhadra figure here you can see only two uh, figures but there is a figure here and even at the back this is another example of a sarvato bhadra image this is a this is a head of parshvanatha this is nayagamesha this is from mathura this is now in the mathura museum and this is uh, the pedestal of a jain image as you can see there is a you can see the foreign influence here. we have the winged lion as such as this is a foreign motif and we have devotees here jaina devotees and we have the tri ratna symbol which is surmounted by the dharma chakra the concept of dharma chakra is also found in jainism we have a reference to that in the hathi gumpha inscription of 
Kharavir, which is dated to the first century BCE. These are Ayagapattas or Jain votive tablets. And it is believed that the first images of the Jaina Tirthankaras were uh, represented on the Ayagapattas. They are also known as Aryakapattas. And this is an inscribed <coughs> Ayagapatta. And we can see here pillars. We can also surmounted by the Dharma Chakra. And here there is an elephant. And here there are some of the Ashta Mangalika Chinhas. Even below we have some of the Ashta Mangalika Chinhas. And we can also get get to know what kind of architecture was there because pillars as such, whole pillars have not survived. But from these Ayagapattas, we understand that what kind of architecture was also there. And as you can see, the Jina is seated in uh, the Dhyana Mudra, and there is a chhatra over his head, which indicates that he is a Chakravarti. This is uh, another Ayagapatta, which uh, in all probability shows uh, or depicts the Deva Nirmita Stupa at uh, the Kankali Tila. It's not, it's unfortunately, it's broken. But this is inscribed in the Bam Brahmi script. Here it is written, Ayaga Pate. You can see the word Ayaga Pate. And this is another Ayaga Patta, where, which also has a Jina and uh, some of the Ashta Mangalika Jinas. Here, as you can see, the swastik symbol is there, the Sri Vatsa symbol is there, the Matsya Maya Mithuna symbol is there. So these were widely used in art. Then <clears throat> we come to uh, Buddhism in Mathura. I will speak about Buddhism and then conclude the first part of this lecture. From the references and in inscriptions, we get the name of many Buddhist Viharas in the Mathura region. So we have the Yasha Vihara at Katra Keshav Deva or Sri Krishna Janmasthana, Apanaka Vihara, Khanda Vihara, and Huvishka Vihara. Uh, uh, there is a reference to the Buddha traveling on the highway between Mathura and Veranja in the Anguttara Nikaya. The Avadhana literature speaks about the establishment of Viharas in Mathura by two merchant brothers called Nata and Bhatta. This Vihara would be associated with the Stavira Upagupta, who was a resident of Mathura. It is believed that Upagupta had gone to Mathura to preach to Emperor Ashoka, who expressed a wish to come to Mathura and meet him later. Mathura, as, Yuan Zhang, uh, as per Yuan Zhang, had stupas erect, erected on uh, the mortal remains of the disciples of the Buddha. And these uh, stupas are supposed to have been constructed by Ashoka. So these were stupas on the remains of Sri Putra, Mudgala Putra, Purna Maitrayani Putra, Upali, Ananda, Rahula, as well as stupas dedicated to Bodhisattvas like Manjushri and others. Now, in the opinion of uh, Vinay Kumar Gupta, in all probability, Yuan Zhang never actually visited Mathura. And we may state that his depictions may be based partially on hearsay and partially on records which might have been available to him. So we come to the figures of both the Buddha and Bodhisattvas. <clears throat> now there has been an ongoing debate in uh, the field of Indian art history that which school was the pioneer in creating the Buddha figure. Foreign scholars generally say that it was the uh, Gandhara school of art, whereas Indian scholars like V.S. Agarwal, Vasudev Sharan Agarwal, Ananda Kumar Swami, they say that the first Buddha image was made in the Mathura school of art. <clears throat> Based their the opinion of uh, the Indian scholars was mainly based on their conclusion on the dated images in the Shaka era, which started in 78 CE which is supposed to be traditionally uh, the date of Kanishka's coronation, but this date has been now challenged. So we cannot accept this now. I'm just giving this as a, uh, you know, what was recorded. And uh, new research has shown that Kanishka actually ruled in the second century CE and not in the first century CE. According to Nipu Joshi also, the Buddha image was first made in Mathura. 
before the first century bce mathura was a center of vaishnavism especially the bhagavata religion and the related aspect of bhakti had a great influence on the religious traditions in mathura and bhakti has its some scholars say that bhakti uh, has its roots in the bhagavata dharma but actually bhakti we find the word bhakti even in the upanishads like the shweta shvatara upanishad so bhakti is a very old concept and uh, bhakti was greatly responsible for the rise of image worship because you know you need to have a kind of a personal contact with your votary when it comes to bhakti it is uh, there is a lot of personalism in the practical aspects of bhakti so bhakti also influenced the jaina images of tirthankaras and uh, the bhakti, concept of bhakti was gradually gaining ground then uh, we have the worship of symbols in buddhism so there was a tradition of making offerings of lambs flowers flower garlands incense which was prevalent in buddhism and uh, we have the mahasanghika initiating reforms in buddhism and followers of the mahasanghika school considered it right to uh, worship images of the buddha before nirvana actually before his enlightenment buddha was known as bodhisattva as after nirvana no one could enter this world or be visualized in any form buddha had a tend to sambodhi but he postponed his nirvana to remain in this world to preach his dhamma for the benefit of all now some schools of buddhism regard the regard that when the buddha attained enlightenment at that time only he attained nirvana some schools of buddhism believe this but generally we understand that he attained sambodhi he became the samyaka sambuddha and <clears throat> he attained uh, nirvana at the age of 40 almost 40 years after he attained uh, sambodhi now image of the buddha who attained nirvana not possible but an image of a bodhisattva could be created which could be seen and offered worship to by the devotees so the early figures of the buddha are called bodhisattvas in inscriptions <clears throat> once the buddha had attained nirvana he cannot get connected with the physical world again what does the word nirvana mean nirvana means total extinction nothing remains so when nothing remains how can you have an image of the buddha who has already attained nirvana when he got his sambodhi or even when he attained his final nirvana that is when in mundane language we will say that when he passed away <clears throat> now unless there was some drastic change in the philosophy of buddhism the followers would not have accepted the buddha image also we have a, uh, the impact of the bhagavata dharma on buddhism and uh, according to vs agarwal the mahayana sect of buddhism was the buddhist version of the bhagavata dharma and the mahayana sect uh, had this phil- its philosophy comprising of this principle that we should work for the welfare of all whenever you make a donation it is for the welfare of this entire world and from the concept of nirvana gradually the focus of the buddhists especially the mahayanists it turned towards the welfare of all beings this we find uh, in a number of inscriptions coming from uh, uh, the buddhist caves in the deccan where donations were made and donation and the merit which would be procured after making these donations was not restricted to just the family of the donor but it was for all uh, sentient beings which were there in this world it was for the good of the entire world so it was for the sarva satvanam hita sukhaya sarva satvanam hita sukar sukartham so this is inscribed on many buddha images of the kushana period 
the whole depiction of the buddha was that of a lokottara purusha we have a sect among the buddhists known as lokottara vadins who considered buddha to be a lokottara purusha or as an extraordinary human being according to vasudev sharan agarwal the image of a, of the buddha who was a yogi could not have been uh, created due to foreign influence we have many buddha images dating to the reigns of kanishka and huvishka which have been found in mathura there is no buddha image in the mathura school of art which can be dated prior to the reign of kanishka this is very important and there what is the difference between uh, the depiction of the images of bodhisattvas and buddha so bodhisattva is dressed in all kinds of royal finery like a prince whereas the buddha is shown wearing a simple sanghati or a robe and wears no ornaments so this is uh, an image uh, of the buddha you can see here bodo written on the coins of kanishka now you will also see how kanishka perhaps looked this image is on the coin is similar to that which we find in stone so we can understand how he must have looked and uh, apart from the buddha kanishka had various other deities also represented on his coins the earliest dated image of the buddha is uh, the second regnal year of kanishka we have two types of buddha images standing and seated and both are very different from the artistic point of view the buddha image is a combination of the ideals of a yogi and chakravarti a buddha is also known as dharma chakravarti a person who wins this whole world through dharma through his teachings the standing images of the buddha uh, are similar to the yaksha figures of uh, the shunga period the seated image is uh, designed on the lines of the digga tapasi which is uh, found on the railing uh, railings from bahrut and uh, some scholars also say that the seated image of the buddha was uh, uh, inspired by the jina images on the ayaga pattas the early figures uh, the head is completely shaven whereas the later figures have short curls of hair which figures wear an almost transparent sanghati or robe which has been mentioned in the vinaya texts now what are the features of the kushana period buddha figures they are mostly clean shaven with a protruding part of the skull that is the ushanisha here you can see or there is an urna mark on the forehead between the two eyebrows here as you can see which is one of the mahapurusha lakshanas this is mentioned in the in one of the biographies of the buddha which is the lalita vistara where during the mara vijaya a flame appeared from the buddha's forehead of course uh, it appeared later as well in later episodes also and this is a very important feature of the kushana period buddha images then uh, <clears throat> the right hand is in the abhaya mudra and the left is resting on the thigh in the case of seated figures and holding the sanghati in the case of standing figures the shoulders are broad the eyes are fully open and uh, there is a gentle smile on the face less attention is given to the part of the body below the waist there is a certain stiffness which can be observed the sanghati sticks to the upper part of the body and covers on the left shoulder and it has a transparent effect standing uh, figures have images like lotus bud lion or maitreya buddha or a female figure between the two feet there is a prabha mandala or a halo in low relief this is one of the major characteristics of the mathura buddha images and it was fully developed in the gupta period as you can see here also you can see crescents on the border of the prabha mandala here the prabha mandala is not very elaborate but but still i mean it is very prominent can't miss it here you can uh, see he is seated on a lion throne as such this is a particular image is from katra keshav deva 
then uh, huge images have been carved in bold relief and uh, they are to be seen only from the front so there even in some of the buddha figures attention is given mainly to the frontality of the sculpture they may have a knotted waist band or kaya bandha then there are basically four mudras in which we find the buddha images abhay bhumi sparsha dharma chakra pravartana and dhyana varada mudra is absent also uh, figures of dhyani buddhas and bodhisattvas were also produced uh, in the mathura school of art so here is another seated figure of the buddha he seated as you can see uh, the sanghati on his uh, you can see layer of the sanghati on his left shoulder and the sanghati almost has a transparent uh, effect this is a standing figure of the buddha unfortunately the part of his legs can't be seen But here uh, is in the abhaya mudra and as we saw the other hand the left hand holds the sanghati here you can see the slightly long ear lobes which are known as the pralamba karna pasha and uh, here you can see the urna mark the usha nisha and if you see uh, you know this particular image it has that boldness of the older yaksha figures of the shunga period though stylistically it is different but it that element of boldness is still there and this is a seated image of buddha again from <clears throat> mathura very boldly executed and among uh, the images as such if we see uh, of the kushana period the both buddha and bodhisattva images are the highest in number then this is <clears throat> a depiction of uh, bodhisattva maitreya who is shown in all royal finery according to some scholars this is an image of maitreya i will clarify this is also an image of maitreya <clears throat> you can see maitreya carrying a pot which is one of his attributes <clears throat> so i will uh, stop here for today and uh, continue in the next lecture thank you so much We'll stop here for today. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.